Hello, friends. We are almost ready to start. We're going to start at about 2 o'clock p.m., so just a couple more minutes. I uh, appreciate your patience. The reason you can't hear anything is because we're getting ready. Um, if your uh, name on Zoom doesn't match your real name, that might be because it matches your teacher's name because your teacher's got the link. They're all listed under their names. Don't worry. If uh, it's not your real name and you ask a question, just put your real name in the question and then I'll, we'll be able to direct the answer to the right person. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second day of SciFest Video Conferencing Festival. My name is Karen from Australian Environmental Education, and today we are going to explore the kinds of things that could be found in your backyard. So we've got uh, Ben that's going to be helping us with questions into the Q&A. Um, so there will be a few times that I'll be showing you some things that you may recognise or you might not have seen before. And these are the kinds of things that you can put your answers into the Q&A as well. And if you've got any questions that uh, you would like answered, um, we'll need to do that as well. Now, teachers, um, you would have been provided the YouTube live link and um, a link to the Virtual Excursions Australia website. If you've got lots and lots of your students in the webinar, you will need to redirect them to the YouTube live link and the uh, Virtual Excursions Australia website because we're reached capacity of the webinar and um, all of the students are meant to be viewing on the live stream. So you'll be able to stay in the webinar teachers and that means you can ask questions on behalf of your students. But if you've got many, many of your students in the webinar with you, you might need to redirect them to the YouTube live link and the uh, Virtual Excursions Australia SciFest YouTube website link. You would have been emailed this this morning with both of those links um, directly to your um, email address that you registered. Okay, everyone. So let's explore some of the things that we might find in our backyards. So the first thing I'd like you to all think about is just the variety of animals on earth. So just imagine in the room you are in that there's a hundred animals. I'll let you have a think of that for a moment. But first, we need to think about all of the animals on earth. So the main things when we have these thousands, millions of animals is thinking about classification. So the two big groups that things get broken up into, first, plants and animals, and then from animals, it's animals with a backbone and animals without a backbone. If you're not sure, put your hand behind your back, feel your spine, you can feel those bones in your spine, they're called vertebrae. Animals with a backbone or an internal skeleton are called vertebrate animals. Animals without are called invertebrates. The five groups of animals that do have internal skeletons, mammals, birds, fish, amphibians, and reptiles. All other animals are invertebrates. So knowing that piece of information, if you have 100 animals in your room, how many of them are invertebrates don't have a backbone. Now you can imagine these animals from the deepest ocean to the highest mountain, to freshwater creek, to the desert, 
but 100 animals, how many of them do you think don't have backbones? Try to pop in the Q&A. We'll maybe see if Ben can uh, give us some numbers and we'll, I'll let you know whether it's higher or lower. So out of 100 animals, how many don't have backbones? Hmm. Ah, we've got lots of guesses of a 50-50 split. Well, uh, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got some 20s and some 40s. Someone said 99 out of 100 animals. Oh, well, you know what? That's certainly the closest. It's about 98 to 99% of all animals on earth are these animals called invertebrates, these animals without a backbone. So next time you need to imagine 100 animals in a room, you need to be thinking about these invertebrates. But most of the time when we're thinking about protecting animals or learning about them, we're thinking about the big things, usually birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians and fish. But today we're going to talk about some of the clues and things that might give you evidence that you've got some of those invertebrates, some of those 99% of animals living in your very own backyard. So I'm going to share a few things that I found. Now bear with me, I've got lots of things on the table to share with you today. I'm going to start off with this one here. Let me zoom in for you. We'll focus. There we go. So this is something that I found in my backyard hanging from underneath a branch. Let me pop in the chat or the Q&A, sorry if you know what this might be. Any guesses, Ben? Yes, we've got uh, some sort of pod or maybe a bag worm. Um, is it an ant? Is it some bark? We've got lots of people guessing a cocoon. Oh, excellent. Well, I'm not going to give it away completely just yet. I've got some beautiful pictures to show you. So here's my next one. What do people think this might be? Mm. If you're watching the YouTube live stream, you can still have a think. I always like being at home yelling at my television if I know the answer or my computer screen. Mm -hmm. A few people think this one might be a bird's egg or a shell, maybe a nut. Ooh, I love it. Now, this is about the size of a 20-cent piece. It's a little bit squishy. I'm going to give you a clue. It is a type of egg sac. So I'm going to show you that one in a moment. So these are all things that you could find when you're exploring your backyard or local area. And sometimes the things are very, very small. And imagine these ones here. These are, I'm going to tell you, these are different eggs of about three or four different types of stick insects. And each one of these eggs would have one baby stick insect when it hatches out. But imagine these falling in the leaf litter at the bottom of a tree. Almost impossible to see because lots of the thing living in your backyard like to camouflage. This is something that's going to be really common we'll start seeing when it's summer. There are a lot of them in here. And this is a great clue that this particular animal is around. Well, I've got two different types of these. I think uh, some people are saying that these look like insects. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a few people who've got the right guess, but I don't want to give the answer away either. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we're going to show it in a moment. So these are two different types. And of course, we can't forget the big common things like this that we might find. Feathers, bird's nests, uh, spider silk, all of these kinds of things are great clues that you have different animals around because only birds have feathers. And by looking at the colour and the size, it can give you a clue to what size bird it was or what animal it was. And we're going to talk about sounds as well as we go through the session, because sometimes it's not just what you see, it's what you hear as well. Okay, let me share some of, some of my slides with you. 
and I'll give you the answer to some of the things we just looked at. Some of you probably guessed right, but some of you. Okay. So this is a photo of my backyard. Just to give you a clue, it's probably about the space of a metre and a half. And all of these circles in orange are all evidence of spiders. Now, I was really excited when I found all of these because I love spiders in my backyard. I'm not so happy about them being spiders inside, but spiders in my backyard are great. So some of them were the full spider. These were St. Andrew's cross spiders. Some were egg sacs. Some is a curled leaf. And some of this one here looks like a little fuzzy ball are actually spiderlings, so baby spiders. Here we can see them just hatched out of an egg sac. They're still bundled together. And the spiders will need to move. So they do something called ballooning. They put a layer of silk out and let the wind catch them to move into different areas so they're not all together. And here's our shell, the exoskeleton of a cicada. I think many of you probably guessed it was in one of those boxes. Really common to find as the weather's warming up on trees, fences, the side of houses. And this is the shell, or the exoskeleton that gets left behind of the cicada that has spent up to seven years living on the underground, uh, sucking sap off the tree roots. And when it emerges, it leaves these amazing shells. I love to collect them. And I still do today. And this is what an adult cicada looks like. Sometimes we don't see the adults. We might just see the shell or we might hear the amazing sounds that cicadas make. And remember, sometimes it's the sound of an animal that's the clue that they're around in your backyard and you may not see the adult. So cicadas come in lots of different colours. This is a greengrocer. And unfortunately, the more places we're putting concrete and hard surfaces down, there are lots of times that the cicadas can't come up from their burrows. So think about the changes within five years or 10 years that could impact on cicadas emerging from the ground. Other times the clues are munch marks, teeth, chew marks that we may have in leaves, things like stick insects, caterpillars, any sort of plant eating um, uh, invertebrates are going to make these um, patterns. It could also be scratches on trees. It could be all of these other kinds of marks or traces that get left behind. Now, this is a photograph that my sister took in her backyard. And I was able to identify this um, caterpillar because of the big yellow eyebrow. And it's a slightly bluish colour as well. And by identifying the caterpillar, I was able to work out that it's a blue triangle butterfly. And one of the ways you can tell butterflies from moths apart uh, the antennae. We can see the beautiful smooth antennae on the blue triangle butterfly. And moths have feathery looking antennae. Butterflies are generally brighter in colour and are usually seen in the day. Moths are generally more neutral in colour and, are, and you see more at night. Mm, this is one of the clues that we saw lying around, one of the egg sacs that I showed you. Now, this is the egg sac from a praying mantis. So they're about the size of a 20 cent piece and they're actually kind of built layer upon layer to create that egg sac. When they hatch out, they are tiny. This is a baby praying mantis that I actually found the day I photographed all those spiders. So unfortunately, I don't think this praying mantis was able to grow up. It was probably only hours old. It was almost see-through almost translucent and less than the size of your pinky fingernail. So quite amazing discovery. I was very pleased to find it. And of course, this is an adult praying mantis. Sometimes you're lucky to see these ones. Praying, adult praying mantis can range in size. Some species are only five centimetres in size. This one's well over 10 centimetres. Um, often green, but they come in browns and different colours as well. So keep an eye out. If I can show you very carefully, let's see if I can zoom back in. So when I was collecting some leaves for the program today, 
Let's see if I can show you. Well, maybe this way. Here he is. I was collecting leaves because I've got some stick insects that I'll show you in a moment. And this little praying mantis was in the leaves. So he's only about two centimetres in size at the moment, probably only a week or so old. And if you look closely, sometimes you'll be able to find amazing things just in the leaves. And if I show you, these were the leaves I collected this morning. So in one section of leaves, I saw a little bit of movement. So really sometimes having those close looks, you never know what you'll find. And whilst we're having a look here, what can we see or can we see anything in the leaves at the moment? I gave you a clue what should be in there. And I think this is one that you can all call out at your screens. What word do we use when an animal blends in to the background? Ah, I think a few people know. So I think some people have found your little critters in amongst those leaves. Well they, done. And they know that when an animal blends into its environment, it's called camouflage. Well done, everyone. And there are four stick insects in the branches. So one, two, three. Let's see if you found them all for so sometimes being able to see them against the different color background really helps and just imagine when these are 30 meters up a tree quite impossible to find so the big ones here are females and these are the crown stick insect because let's see if i can zoom in we'll get a bit of focus here we go you can see there's a little crown on their heads and that's where they get their name from so quite beautiful they're definitely making those munch marks in the leaves they'll be dropping those different kinds of egg sacs and leaving their shed skin this one wants to stay with me doesn't want to come off the hand okay let's go back there's still a couple more clues that we haven't um, solved yet Okay, so a lot of you were guessing we had bagworm, we had cocoons. So this is a case moth cocoon, often called bag moths as well. Bagworms is another one that I've heard. And they're really quite amazing because they will actually chew bits of stick and stitch it to their silky cocoon. So the caterpillars will make their own silk. And this is one that I had in with my stick insects for quite a while. And I love this photo here. It looks like he's wearing a woolly jumper. And that's actually the silk around the edge of its cocoon and what they will then close and usually attach to a branch. So they'll come out and eat. They'll use their little forearms and their major massive mouth parts to chew up the leaves. And then they will move back inside the bag and close it up like a little drawstring and hang upside down. And some species of these will actually stay in their um, cocoon, their little bag, their whole life. They will never um, change their life cycle. Mm. Now, I mentioned one of these before, these curled leaves. Anyone, well, I'm sure a lot of you have seen these. Remember one day I was walking my kids to school and I counted 87 of these leaf curling spiders. And I have to say, it was only about a kilometre. So it was quite amazing. And these are in a spider web. You'll always see them in a spider web. And it's actually the home the leaf curling spider makes. So again, like the case moth creating and using silk to create that cocoon, the spider will actually chew little bits of uh, leaf off. And when the leaf is green, use its silk to stitch it and curl it and pull that tight to create another habitat. So you'd think that the web itself would create enough protection, but these spiders want just that little bit more. So they'll have their leaf, stuck um, and sort of stitched into their spider web and they'll hide inside. So they're quite a small spider. Um, their body is only about the size of your thumbnail. And we can see the abdomen there. This is actually looking straight through one of the curls of um, a leaf to see the abdomen of the spider. And every now and again, you'll see them come out at the bottom. So we can see the spider out at the bottom 
of the leaf there. So a great way to provide a little bit of extra protection. Mm, let's see what's next. So another caterpillar here, really different. This is quite long compared to the other one with beautiful orange um, and black and white stripes. Now, I wasn't able to identify this particular caterpillar from the colours. I was able to identify it by this. This amazing cocoon or chrysalis, it's what they're called, it was almost silver and mirrored and reflective. And I thought that was unique. And sure enough, when I was able to research and typed in to scientist Google, the type of uh, chrysalis I found, it came up that this is an oleander butterfly chrysalis. And I waited. I was very lucky. This was outside my front door. So not technically in my backyard, it was in my front yard. And over a three-week period, there was two caterpillars that at different stages had turned into a chrysalis. And I was able to also see it. I watched every day to see it emerge from the chrysalis. We can see it just up in the top there. And the beautiful butterfly drying its wings. Once it, the butterfly had emerged, I was able to confirm that I had the right identification. Sometimes you have to wait if something goes through a life cycle change or metamorphosis. Um, sometimes you need to double check. So once it was an adult butterfly, I was able to identify it um, that I was correct. Now, a lot of these animals, when they go through metamorphosis, like cater um, caterpillars turning into a butterfly, the cicadas emerging, dragonflies emerging, they need to dry their wings before they can fly away. So it took a couple of hours for this particular butterfly after it had emerged to rest and slowly move its wings until it could fly away. Hmm. Now, this is an interesting one. A lot of people living near fresh water. Let's remember that a lot of the times things are living not on land, they're living in fresh water or they're living in both fresh water and um, on land, depending on different parts of their life cycle. So I can tell you that this is a nymph of a fresh water animal, but as an adult, it flies around on land, well, in the sky. Wonder, Ben, if anyone's got any ideas about what this animal might be if you're on the live stream just yell out at your television we'll mm. let you know if you're right all right uh i'm i'm looking people are pretty uh pretty impressed with it but i'm not sure we're getting a lot of oh goodness uh a dragonfly maybe Ooh. or someone said a water bug a wasp well, it is 100% a type of different water bug and it is a dragonfly nymph, so well done. And this is an adult dragonfly. So the clue to look for when you see these is often around the eyes. The same with the cicada. It was often around the head. That's the part of the animal that tends to look the same as a juvenile and an adult. And we can see those eyes as an adult here. Again, I was so lucky to capture this photograph because it had just emerged from my backyard pond and it was drying its wings. So it was there for about mm, half an hour to an hour, just long enough for me to get some really beautiful and lucky photos. We can see the amazing um, wings there and the beautiful colour. So lots of different dragonflies, lots of different colours, but they'll all spend the first part of their life in water as a dragonfly nymph and they go through an incomplete metamorphosis to an adult. Now, there's another animal that looks really similar called a damselfly. Now, I'll give you a trick to tell damselflies and dragonflies apart. So at rest, like this one here, dragonflies rest with their wings flat out of their body. Damselflies at rest will have their wings up. So they're along their body, their wings will be up. Dragonflies, their wings will be flat. So that's one of the ways you can tell those two um, different species apart. Mm, depending on where you live in Australia, some of you will know this one straight away. Some of you may be a little bit challenged. There's two clues in this photo. One here and one here. 
Ben, have we got a few people making guesses? I can see lots coming through. Oh, wow. Let's have a look. Oh, I'm on the wrong end of the chat, so I can't see the fresh answers. <laughs> oh, yes, we've got a few there. So absolutely, wombat is the correct answer for that one there. And it's the clue is the poo. So often the clue can be the poo, or sometimes scientists will actually call them scats. So if you hear someone talk about scats, there actually is a fancy name for poo. And there's actually a scientist called scatologists that um, actually study poo. Okay, wombat poo is square. It's one of the only animals that does these really cube-shaped poos. Another part of the clue is we can see lots of grass in it as well. So it does give us a, a, some extra information about the diet of the wombat. And of course, we've got this big burrow here that is another link to a wombat. So sometimes it's a trace or a scat that is left behind that gives us information about what animal it might be. And that's our lovely wombat. Mm. This is an interesting one. I'm going to give you a clue. This comes from the other end of the animal. Mm. So I can see lots of bits of bone, lots of fur, even a few feathers in there as well. Scientists, these are really important things for scientists to find. They actually tell um, them a lot of information about what's going on in the environment and the animals there. It can look a little bit disgusting, but it is really, really important. Oh, excellent. So I can see there, uh, Nicole has said that it's an owl pellet and it's absolutely. So a few of you might've seen them, but didn't know what they, they are. Um, and yeah, they're called owl pellets. And essentially it's owl vomit. It's a bit disgusting. So we call them owl pellets. It sounds a lot nicer, but it's kind of what's spit up by the, um, the owl because they're eating their predators. They're eating lots of things with feathers, uh, bones and fur, and they can't digest. They can't break down all of that material. So they need to regurgitate it or vomit it back up to get it out of their system. So it looks a little bit disgusting. It sounds a little bit disgusting, but you know what? If you find these around, it's amazing clues that you've got beautiful, big predatory owls or other hunting birds in your environment, uh, which is really exciting. Scientists also like to look at them because it gives them a clue of what these birds have been eating. And in some cases, how far they may have been traveling to find their food. If they find something in there that it's not found in that local area. So sometimes poo's a clue, sometimes it could be animal pellets, sometimes it could be things like feathers, sometimes it's the sounds, that we're listening to, there is so many different um, choices. And this is a powerful owl hiding in a tree hollow during the day before it comes out and hunts at night. Hmm. We talked about camouflage before. This one here is a camouflaged striped marsh frog. They're quite a big frog probably over 10 centimetres in size, like hiding in the soil and the leaf litter. So quite a common uh, frog to find in backyards across Australia. I've just been noticing something out of the corner of my eye for a while and it's been moving around and I didn't realise what it was and I've just discovered it's a spider <laughs> just here. Might zoom in to see if we can see it. So not only was it a praying mantis that came in with my leaves, there's also a little spider. And it's been trying to make a web. Let's see if we can see it. Just there. I can see it. So it has been moving around in the corner of my eye and I thought it was um, just one of the leaves too close to me. And then I saw it silk. So there you go, guys. Sometimes only half a centimetre in size. And that is a jumping spider. Did you see how quick it jumped? That was pretty cool. <laughs> 
So I'm going to talk about frogs in a little while, but I just wonder, I know it's going to be a little bit tricky because so many things have been coming through the chat, but if you've got a specific question, you might want to type it in or something we might have missed in the big long line of um, wonderful responses you were giving to some of the things I was showing. So I'm just going to show you my frog whilst you can put some new questions in the chat or repeat a question if we missed it. But Ben, please let me know if you've got a few that you've been holding on for me. Mm, absolutely. So uh, I know somebody wants to know if your stick insects are dangerous. As Exactly as you were saying that, one of them just dropped off the branch. So they're not dangerous. They're herbivores. Um, they don't bite. There's a couple of species that are really, really big. And when I hold them, um, and I'm talking, you know, two or three times the size of this one. When I hold them, especially because I like to be upside down, they can be a little bit heavy and it can pull um, on the skin. But it hurts, but it's not dangerous. So, no, they're not dangerous at all. They are plant eaters and really great to have around. Great plant recyclers. They'll chew and eat lots of plant material, and poo it out at the end, which is great fertiliser. Um, for the soil and breaks down a lot of material there. So no, not dangerous at all. Uh, and uh, I've got a question about a praying mantis. Mm -hmm. Do you know if praying mantis, uh, praying mantises look after their babies? Um, I've never seen that. So they do spend a really good amount of time making the egg sacs. So they go to the effort to, to make an egg sac that all of the little eggs are laid inside, and that's to protect them. So instead of laying lots of eggs scattered all over the place, which the stick insects do, the praying mantis make an egg case for all of those small eggs to be inside. So they're definitely doing their best to um, give their young and the eggs once they hatch out a really good chance. And that's why the egg sacs are often um, hiding. They're kind of half wrapped around little bits of sticks and twigs hiding in um, in the leaves. So very well camouflaged. And that is another good clue that they're trying to look after their young. But I ha once they hatch out, it's usually, you know, up to up to the young to, to survive. Can I ask one more? Of course. So uh, somebody wants to know that if you, uh, if you find a cocoon hanging on a plant, does it hurt the animal inside to pull the cocoon off? If you're very, very careful, it's usually fine. So the, all the ones that I've got here, these kinds, you can see that I've actually broken it off at the stick. So I haven't tried to separate the actual egg sac from the branch. Now, when I had a close look at these as well, I also could tell that they'd already hatched out. One, one actually had hatched out and there was a spider living inside it that had decided that this was a nice, safe place to hide. For things like these ones here, um, you can absolutely remove them, but you, don't, you want to make sure that if you are looking after them for a little while that you've got lots of food and an enclosure to care for them. So I've, I had one in with my stick insects for about six months and it would just move around. Um, if it is really lovely attached to a branch, you could break off the branch if you didn't want to do any damage and then look after, you know, keep an eye on it for a couple of days and then you can actually put the whole thing um, back into the backyard. So often it's quite nice if you are looking for things to maybe bring them inside for small periods of time and then let them back out. The same way as I've got a little guy here that I found a couple of weeks ago. Let's see. You can see him there. There's a small praying mantis. So this one's only about five centimetres in size. They like to climb. So every time I move the container, it's climbing. So here he is here. So only about five centimetres in size. Um, I found him accidentally when I was, again, collecting more leaves. And I've just been had him inside um, to show when I'm doing uh, sessions at the moment. And then next week, he'll go back outside. Um, it's a tricky one as well, because there's so many spiders in my backyard. I don't want to be giving snacks to all of the um, spiders. So it's a bit of a balance in terms of protecting uh, the animals as well. Do we have another question there, Ben? Otherwise, I've got a bit of a frog friend to show. Or, you know what? 
if I if I read you every question, we would be here all day. So I'm really keen on seeing this frog, but I'll note some questions down. Excellent. Let's have a little look. Oh, he likes to look at himself in the camera. So let's see. There we go. We've got our focus going. So this one here is a green tree frog. Now we can see he's showing off so beautifully. We can see those beautiful sticky pads on his foot. And they've got five toes on their feet, but only four fingers. Oh, now he's just going to show off his belly. Frogs are well also are amazing. We can see his mouth going side to side. They can open their mouth so wide. Um, and I'm going to try to feed him at the end, but unfortunately he wasn't very hungry uh, today and didn't want to eat. But they've got a really different body features to us. So their tongue is attached at the front of their mouth. Our tongues are attached at the back. So when we swallow, we use our tongue to push food down. But these guys, they can't. So they'll actually close their eyes to help push food down into their body. So we might not be able to see that today. But the main reason I wanted to show my frog today is the idea of creating frog-friendly backyards. Oh, <laughs> he just wants to show off his tummy now. I'll have another shot of him if he comes back. So frog-friendly environments are a really good one to think about. So if we have a, have a think about frogs. They're one of those animals that do have backbones. They are vertebrate animals. They're amphibians. And their skin is really important. So if we think about our skin, our skin acts as a barrier. It's waterproof. It's, it protects us. Whereas the skin of frogs actually can let water in and out, can let oxygen in and out. So if there's something like pollution in the water, it can actually really affect the frogs. Having things on our hands as well. So if you do find a frog in your backyard, it's actually really important you don't pick it up. That's why I've got my frog in this container here with a little bit of water in there. And I make sure when I get him out of his tank in the morning that I haven't used moisturiser, haven't used sunscreen, haven't had anything on my hands um, and then when I put him back, I actually don't touch him. I just let him crawl out of the, the little enclosure there because anything on my hands won't, don't necessarily absorb into my skin, but will absorb into the frog skin. So that's why it's really important that we don't collect frogs. And if you do need to rescue a frog, um, yeah, try to do it with a container so you're not touching them directly. But frogs have been quite well adapted, many species, to live in our urban environments. So how do we think about creating environments that are really healthy for them? So one of the main ways is not spraying a lot of pesticides so their food that they eat doesn't make them sick. Creating habitats and homes. We mentioned before frogs need water as part of their life cycle. So they always need somewhere that they, um, where they can lay their eggs. So you can actually make temporary frog ponds or permanent frog ponds or even frog hotels that I'll show a picture of in a moment as well. But the important thing about frogs, some of the big ones you may see, but most of the time you're not going to see frogs. You're going to hear them. So Australia has 240 different species of frog and they all have different calls. So we can easily identify frogs from what they sound like, even if we don't see them. So there's a great program by the Australian Museum called Frog ID, which is free. And they've got an app that you can re record frog calls on your smartphone or a smart device or your parent's smartphone. And then it'll submit them to the Australian Museum and they'll identify the frog for you. So it's a great way for identifying frogs in your backyard. So sometimes you need to listen. Now, guys, a lot of the time when you're exploring your backyard, it's going to be daytime. But lots of different animals only come out at night. So have a think about some of the noises you hear in the night. Is it possums? Maybe it's the bats, um, the fruit bats coming to find um, flowers from a nearby tree. Could it be an owl? Could be frog calls. So I'm going to send a link to all the teachers tomorrow. It's got a whole really good identification on some noises in the night 
to help you um, listen to what might be there. So just remember, it's not always one part of the day. You need to think about 24-hour cycle, seasonal. We've got lots, some animals that migrate. At the moment, at, in my backyard, I've got lots of currawongs, quite noisy bird in the morning, and they've just come in. I've been able to tell I've got currawongs from the black feathers, their call, but also the poo. Currawongs like to eat lots of fruits out of plants, so they often have very um, fruity uh, poos and they're really, the ones in my backyard at the moment are really kind of reddish so I've been able to tell the currawongs are back in town because of the poos so sometimes it is those scats that we need to keep an eye out for as well okay Ben do we have another couple more questions and I might quickly show frog hotel and insect hotel before we wrap up we do have loads and loads of questions my goodness gracious so one very popular question that I'm getting is that a lot of our friends know that some toads are poisonous. Are there any frogs that are poisonous? Certainly in Australia, our poisonous um, amphibian is the cane toad. So cane toad is an introduced species, very poisonous, it's got big poison glands behind its head. And in other parts of the world, very bright coloured frogs um, often are considered poisonous. But in Australia, we only have native frogs. And as far as I know, we don't have any that are considered poisonous. Um, another little frog question. I know that I can't breathe underwater. I have to hold my breath to swim. Uh, but I know fish can breathe underwater. What about frogs? Are they like me or are they like the fish? Oh, that's a great question. So we need to think about their life cycle again. So lots of you will know that frogs spend the first part of their life cycle as tadpoles in the water and they are breathing air through gills more like a fish. But when they go through their metamorphosis and they turn into an adult frog, on land they're actually breathing with lungs. So what an amazing change that metamorphosis is for the frog. Um, but remember that their skin is quite amazing. So they can actually absorb quite a lot of oxygen and things like that through their skin as well. But they do, as adults, have, have lungs. Quite amazing. Okay, last couple of questions. Yes. Oh, to pick. Well, apologies oh. to everyone if we don't get through them all. We're doing our best. Well, well I'm, I'm already up to 1,300 responses if we did one every second i think we still wouldn't have enough time left uh friends uh i'm just going to have a quick scroll because they're moving past my eyes so quickly uh why is it important to um to look after all of these different sorts of animals well, that's a really good one and i think that really covers the whole idea of this backyard biodiversity session so it's not only looking at what's in our backyard, but our local area, our in, um, ecosystem, our state, our country, our world. It's about doing the little things we can do to protect the animals that are close to us. Having a good variety of plants and animals will keep the habitat healthy. So we need a lot of these things. Remember that 98%, 99% of animals are invertebrates. They're the little things. They're living in the leaf litter. They're hiding in the, in the leaves. They're also part of that food chain and that food web. So without the small things that then are eaten by predators and those uh, at insects or spiders are eaten by birds and so on, it creates a really important part of food chains and food webs. And if you start losing different species, sometimes those food webs can break down and we end up, especially in urban environments, with what's kind of called a monoculture. So we end up with only the same types of things over and over. And to have healthy environments, we need a big variety. We need big biodiversity, so diversity of life. So biodiversity, the more variety that we can have, the healthier those environments will be. And that's why it's important. I'm going to quickly show you now to create different healthy habitats as well. So what I've got here is an insect hotel. This is one that's just been made in a tub, an old plastic um, plant container. And I've got curled bark, leaves, seeds, nuts, uh, pods. I'll actually zoom into some other things I've collected for 
an insect hotel today. It's really simple. You can also make them with just toilet roll holders. Here's one here. Create lots of them, stack them together, tie them together. If I can just zoom in there. Just a little bit of a variety of the things that you could use to make an insect hotel paper bark, curled bark, all of these kinds of things will create habitat. And that's a really important part as well. So not only not spraying pesticides and learning about what's living in your backyard, creating little micro habitats, small habitats can be great. If there's no trees with hollows in them in your neighbourhood, you could um, build a nest box. If you know that you have frogs nearby but not in your backyard, you could build a frog pond. Or if I can share one last slide, you could also build a frog hotel. That's, that's the insect hotel. Oh, there we go. A frog hotel in a container with some tubes. Um, tree frogs really like to hide in those. Even tubes like that or big strips of bamboo, you can tie to a branch of a tree because not all frogs will live in water and frogs can actually drown. So even if you do create little frog ponds for them, make sure there's lots of sticks and rocks so they can climb out and stay safe. But by creating these little micro habits, you can encourage more variety of animals into your backyard, putting different plants in, maybe helping um, in the garden and thinking about the food plants that you've got. Are there things that um, animals can eat? Are there lots of flowers for pollen? All of these things can create very, very um, awesome um, variety in your backyard and increasing that backyard biodiversity. Okay, Ben, I know that there were lots of questions. Is there one or two sort of common questions that you feel like? We yes, can yes. And I've, uh, I've been doing a little bit of background research to make sure I, that we can answer these ones. So <laughs> someone wanted to know, a lot of people wanted to know how many different sorts of frogs there were in the world. And uh, the latest research I can find says that there are more than 5,000 different sorts of frogs. My goodness gracious. But of course, that doesn't count all the ones we haven't found yet. That's exactly right. And in Australia, it's 240 um, at the moment known species. But if you become a citizen scientist and join the Frog ID project, you could help Australia name um, or discover a new species of frog. Because what they're discovering is some things they thought were one species might turn out to be two or three different species. So, you know, if you want to become a citizen scientist and study and become a scientist, you get to name species that you discover and I remember not only 15 years ago we did a, a, a program on dung beetles and a school in the middle of the city discovered a new species of dung beetle that the Australian Museum identified that's in the middle of an urban environment so you never know what is still out there living in your backyard so it's a good time to start looking uh, somebody else, or lots of somebodies, want to know how you tell the difference between a frog and a toad. Okay, well, in Australia, it's super easy. We only have one species of toad, um, and it's the cane toad. And they're big, they're brown, and they've got big sacs sort of behind their head that are lumpy. And if you squeeze them, the poison comes out. Don't squeeze toads, just as a general rule. But that's where they hold their poison. Luckily, they haven't covered all of Australia yet, but they certainly are very common. So they're a big brown toad um, and they're usually rougher skin, usually. Um, but it's e generally easy in Australia because, hey, at 240 um, are all frogs. Yes, and I, I know that I, I uh, was taught that if you were somewhere else in the world, like if you were in Europe where they've got lots of both, um, then you can look at their legs because frogs have got much longer legs because they do a lot more hopping and a lot more swimming and toads have got shorter legs. But you're right that the skin of frogs is really shiny and moist, but toads have got rough, lumpy, warty skin because they don't spend as much time in the water. Okay. Uh, well, let's sneak two more questions in, Ben. Okie doke. Uh, ah, why do frogs like to show off? <laughs> I don't know if it's all frogs that like to show off. I think my particular frog likes it because he can see himself 
in the screen. So where my camera is, there's a TV, a screen that's uh, showing what um, what is on. So I think he just likes looking at himself. Although I know that when frogs um, croak and sing, they're often showing off for other frogs. They so... certainly are. That's right. So all of the males are calling, making a chorus, sometimes individually, sometimes in really big groups, can be quite loud and often more than one species in the same wetland environment. And they are showing off to attract a mate. Mm. Uh, there's a, a question uh, do toads have tadpoles? Yes. So all amphibians will have that similar life cycle change going from a tadpole to an adult. So in the case, it's just they're turning into an adult toad as opposed to a frog. Uh, and one of my favourite questions that I've been saving it right to the end is let's say I wanted to have lots of those insects and things that you've been showing off and I wanted to have more in my garden. Maybe there's not very many now, but I want to attract them. What sort of thing should I do to make an insect want to visit my backyard instead of my neighbor's backyard? <laughs> Excellent. Well, all of the things that we've spoken about today, making sure that you don't spray too many chemicals in your backyard, um, making sure the plants that you have in your backyard have good food sources. So all animals need food and water. So having water sources, especially when it's in summer, even little dishes out, um, insects as well as birds will, will um, like to get the water from there. But things that are Flowering and pollinating are great for attracting insects as well. And the more of some kinds of insects you attract, the more food there's around for things like spiders and praying mantis to come into your backyard as well. And remembering things as simple as making an insect hotel, frog hotels or small frog ponds, all are going to attract more mini beasts, invertebrates and other animals into your backyard as well. So, all of those things are going to help. Mm -hmm. And I and I uh, I know another little fun fact, and that is that the sorts of flowers you plant change the sorts of animals that come visit you. I don't know whether um, everybody knows this, but birds, for example, just love the color red. So if you've got nice red flowers, more birds might come to visit. Whereas I know bees love purple and white. And so purple and white flowers. So you might like to have a look at the sorts of flowers in your backyard and see what sort of animals you're attracting. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for joining me today. And a special thanks to Ben for managing those thousands of questions that came through. Um, it was great to hear from you and I'll be sending lots of extra information off to your teachers uh, this afternoon and tomorrow so you can continue your journey exploring backyard biodiversity. So it's been great to be here. Thank you to Virtual Excursions Australia for having me today for SciFest 2021 and um, enjoy the rest of National Science Week, everyone, and start exploring your backyard. See you later, everyone.